Thank you. Thank you for being here. Your energy is palpable and contagious. It's such an honor to be able to speak jointly with Kevin Nolan. Um, as you will see, we find lots of companies that were agile at birth and have stayed agile. Not as many examples of large corporations that have gone from traditional ways of managing to agile ways of managing the way Kevin has led the transformation at GE Appliances. So it truly is an honor to be able to talk to him, talk with him about this. Uh, we're going to talk today about leading agile innovation. And I think a lot of people believe that leading agile innovation means, well, you set up dozens of teams, hundreds of teams. You restructure the organization to have squads and tribes and chapters and guilds and lions and tigers and who knows what. That is not my experience. I've seen companies try to do that. And in the past 20 years, I've seen a lot of failures. What we're really trying to do with Agile, with Agile ways of working, the ambition is to build a business that can thrive in turbulent times, in unpredictable times. And what that means is essentially we're going to create a business with a culture of learning and innovation and growth. And if we do that right, we're going to develop a synergistic system of stakeholders, whatever you want to call them, a group that is mutually beneficial, customers, employees, communities, shareholders, that you carefully select to work together to improve results for all of them. And when we talk about winning in business, there's a term that I despise called survival of the fittest. The idea that it's the strongest people that succeed. And when I talk about survival of the fittest, people will say, oh, well, that's Darwin. That's Darwin, that's just the way the world works. And it's not. In fact, that's not Darwin's concept at all. If you study Darwin, if you read The Descent of Man, for example, you'll say, he'll say that the communities that win in a society, in an ecosystem, are the most collaborative. They're the most cooperative systems that work, that win consistently. If they will always beat a group of selfish individuals, even if they're stronger. That's, by the way, that Homo sapiens replaced Neanderthals. Neanderthals were actually stronger. Neanderthals had bigger brains. They did not know how to collaborate. And that's what we're really trying to do with Agile. We're trying to create a system that can innovate and learn and grow. And in order to be able to do that, we have to be able to do three things. Number one, on the left, we have to be able to run the business. We have to be able to create repeatable successes. We have to be able to scale things. We have to be able to use things like Lean Six Sigma to reduce variation in operations. You don't want variation. I don't know about you, when I got on a plane to fly here, I did not want to hear the pilot say, fasten your seatbelt, folks. We are going to try an agile takeoff. <laughs> Never done anything like this before in my life, but we're going to test and learn. And if it doesn't work, let's hope we fail fast. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. I feel the same way when I go in for surgery, when I go in for medical treatment. By the way, major surgery, my definition of major surgery is anything that happens on me. So if it's an ingrown toenail, it is major surgery if I have to go. But I want standard operating procedures when my doctor comes in there. We're looking for checklists. We're looking for redu reduction of variability. On the right-hand side, however, we have to change the business. We have to innovate. And a lot of people will say, well, but innovation is risky. If you think innovation is risky, try stagnation because stagnation is what kills most businesses. We have to innovate. And when we innovate, we're actually increasing variability, intentionally, scientifically, increasing vari variation. But with agile ways of working, the way we do that is we test it in a very controlled environment. And when we find things that don't work, we shut them off quickly. When we find things that do work, we accelerate them and do more of them. And we turn them into standard operating procedures so that we can run the business effectively. 
And then the third thing that we have to do is to harmonize these. Very much like yin and yang, operations and innovations work together. In fact, 75% of the great ideas for agile innovation teams come from operations. They come from people who are closest to the operations, closest to the customers. That's where the ideas come from. And, and no matter how innovative people are, unless they make it into the operations, they never become agile ways of working for the rest of the corporation. That's what we have to do. Unfortunately, what happens in most organizations is that these fall out of balance. That running the business becomes the only way of doing business. And when that happens, we get predict, command, and control environments. We start to believe that the job of managers is to plan. And workers, eh, they just do what they're told. They just execute. And in fact, in the perfect organization, people would just become robots. Perfect organization, they just do exactly what they're told. And the cultures become very boss-centric, very boss-pleasing, as opposed to customer-pleasing. We start to believe that the bosses will know what's best, and we get terrible at doing innovation. In fact, we run innovation as if it were an assembly line, like it was very predictable. So we do our customer research, we generate ideas, and then we predict very specific requirements, and then we just build to complete those requirements. And we verify, and we test, and we deploy, and we maintain, and out at the end comes a widget, an innovation widget. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is well known. Very provable, 70 to 90% of innovations fail. 70 to 90% of innovations fail. And why do they fail? Not because they failed to develop what they planned to develop. They fail because what they planned to develop was not what customers wanted. It was not the right thing to develop. They did it perfectly, it just was not the right thing to develop. Now let me show you how often this turns out to be true. On the left-hand side here, that, that far left bar, this is some work that was done by a professor who looked at the Inc. 500, the fastest growing private companies in the United States. He went back and said, well, it's very interesting that you're successful today, but let's do this. Can we go back to your original business plan and see how you planned to run this business compared to what you're doing today that you're successful? And what he found was two thirds of the time, the successful companies had had to change their original plan significantly to get to success. You find the same thing with venture capitalists, and you're going to hear from a venture capitalist, a, a very famous venture capitalist today. If you look at the plan that they funded through a Series A funding or seed capital funding, and then you look at what it took to get to success, two thirds of their predictions were wrong. Two thirds of the time you had to adapt in order to be able to get to success. Now just some personal experiences from my life. You can tell up here, I'm a very old man. When I grew up, I did not have tablets to play with. I grew up with toys like this slinky. And the slinky, by the way, was not invented as a toy. It was invented in the 1940s by an engineer who was trying to develop a way to stabilize sensitive instruments in turbulent seas. But as he was working on it, it fell from a bookshelf onto a stack of books, onto a table, onto the chair, onto the floor, stood up. He said, this is cool. Took it home, played with it with the neighborhood kids, and it turned into one of the first toys to ever make it into the Toy Hall of Fame. You're probably familiar with a company called Slack if you work in technology. What you may not know is Slack started off as a video game company. It failed as a video game company. And in the failure, the venture capitalist went back in and said, is there anything worth saving in this business? Well, yeah, the tech geeks in the back room, they used this communication tool and they relaunched the company around that communication tool. It became the fastest growing unicorn, the fastest growing private company to reach a billion dollar valuation in the history of the world at that time. I don't know how many of you have ever watched this Disney Frozen animation, what, 2013, yes? So I will tell you, I'm, I'm a father of uh, three children and eight grandchildren. 
I watched this movie darn near every day for about <laughs> two years, particularly with granddaughters. I got so interested in it that I decided to figure out how did they make this movie? And I found out that they had tried to make it. Disney had tried to make this movie like five times, since back, going back to the 1930s. All the time in the movie, Elsa was an evil and ugly witch. Because that's what the book said. She was like Ursula. She was like Cruella de Vil. She was like Maleficent. Halfway through making a four-year movie, halfway through making the movie, a husband and wife songwriting team came in and said, don't kick us out. We have a different idea. Just listen to this song. They played a song called Let It Go. We don't think she's ugly. We don't think she's evil. We think she's misunderstood. Halfway through making the movie, they pivoted completely to make her and Anna beloved sisters, to make her misunderstood, to make her not dependent on a Prince Charming, and because of that, succeeded. Top right-hand corner, YouTube. I don't know how many of you, do you know how YouTube got started? I didn't know. I, went, I was speaking at the World Economic Forum in 2008 at Davos, and I ran into a guy named Chad Hurley, who was a co-founder of YouTube. So how did you, this was brilliant. How did you come up with this? He said, don't be too congratulatory. The idea was we were gonna be an online video dating site. <laughs> and when we launched after one week, we had zero online dating videos. Zero. So we opened it up, put on cats, put on kids, we don't care. That's when it took off. So if you remember only one thing from this discussion today, let it be this. Plan to adapt or plan to fail. Because in a world like today, you cannot predict command and control. What that means is if you're a leader in a major organization, your job changes. What you're really trying to do today is to teach the scientific method to teach people how to do experimentation, not to tell people what to do, to teach people how to do that. I have to admit, I am a recovering bureaucrat. When you get to be a senior consultant and people are coming to ask you for answers, there's nothing better than to stroke your chin and say, oh yes, young cricket, I saw this 30 years ago, here's what you do. It is so tempting. I as a recovering bureaucrat, have had to learn instead to ask three questions. Number one, what do you recommend? What do you mean? You're closest to the customer. What do you recommend? Well, we haven't thought about that. Come back when you do. When they come back, they come back with a recommendation. I ask the second question. How could we test that? How could we test it with real live customers? And when they do that, I say, third question, what do you need from me? And often, unfortunately, the answer is nothing. I, we, we can do this. I, we just didn't know we were allowed to do this. This creates enormous successes and different cultures. One of the things that I, interestingly enough, in studying Agile have done is had conversations with neuroscientists about why Agile ways of working work. What is it that's so good about it? They've explained some interesting things to me. Do you know that when you work with a group to achieve a creative goal, that your brain releases dopamine? It's called the feel-good hormone because you together are working towards a major goal. And when you are working towards a strong purpose, your brain also releases serotonin. It's known as the calming confidence neurotransmitter. And when you're collaborating with others, when they feel like friends that you trust, your brain releases oxytocin. It's the bonding hormone. It's the same hormone that releases when you hug somebody, when you, when you are around a close friend. And when you overcome a challenge, even though you're working hard, your brain releases endorphins. It's what we call the runner's high. How is it that somebody can be working so hard and yet having so much fun, feeling better after a hard workout? It's because of endorphins. It kills pain and it it creates euphoria. At the same time, if you're under stress, your brain releases something called cortisol. Cortisol is what creates heart attacks. Agile reduces the flow of cortisol and it increases the flow of these other things. So it turns out that people that are unhappy at work, we just say, oh, they're disengaged. No, they're not. 
They're suffering chemical withdrawal, painful chemical withdrawal. And good agile leaders will learn how to increase achievement by making purposeful innovation fun and rewarding. If you and your teams are not having fun with agile, you're not doing it right. And what I'd like to do now is to turn the time over to my friend Kevin, who will talk about how he's actually done that at a big company taking a traditional approach, moving it to an agile approach that does this with our brains. So, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daryl, and it's an honor to be here, honor to tell the story I'm about to about what we're trying to do at uh, G Appliances. So G Appliances, we're kind of an old company. Um, we were founded by Thomas Edison, and we got into trouble much as Daryl ex explained. We lost our way, we weren't innovative, and we were slowly dying. And we're dying because of that lack of innovation, but boy, we thought we knew how to run a company. We thought we had the best management principles, the best management practices, but we soon found otherwise. So, Peter Drucker, I'd say this is his most important lesson. What's a business here for? A business is here to create customers. How do you do that? There's two things. There's only two important things a company needs to do. Market, they're great ideas and get some great ideas. That's called innovation, right? That's what we're about. That's what we need to be founded on. And I think all of us need to really think, what is your business about? Is your business about optimizing the customers you have or about creating value for new ones and out there seeking to find new customers? So let's talk about innovation. You know, what is it? Innovation models. Daryl talked a little bit about, you know, this, how you innovate and how companies lose their way. Everyone, I think, knows about Bell Labs. It's storied, amazing things happen. That's the world I lived in growing up in General Electric. We had an innovation lab modeled after Bell Labs. I think most major corporations had that. You see what's on the right? Most people won't think that's an innovation lab, but I'm going to argue with you it is, and it's probably the most successful innovation lab that's ever been on this earth. Talk about Bell Labs. That's what Daryl said. It's not, it wasn't wrong. It did great things. But I'd say it is not the best way to innovate. You know, if you look at this innovation funnel, when I was at General Electric, I was actually one of the specialists at this, and I spread the gospel on this is how you innovate. You start with a bunch of ideas, and then you manage them down to the best one. And manage is part of that funnel. And as the leader of technology, I'm an engineer at heart, this is what I thought my role was in life. And then once you get a good idea, you run into a waterfall process. What's waterfall process designed for? It's designed to resist change. And it's actually needed for many different things. If you're building a house, you don't want a lot of change. If you're flying an airplane, you don't want change. This is a good way to do a lot of things. But if you look at, on the left, this funnel, it gives an illusion of control. But you don't really have that control. It's not really there because the customers aren't really involved in that funnel. So look at the Chesney Hotel, this unproven model. I think many of you will recognize people here on this page. What many people don't realize is the only reason most of the things that they created, the great things they created, I'll argue is because they were at the Chelsea Hotel. These individuals knew each other when they're in the same time period. They worked together. They discussed things together. And without this hotel, let's just pick one, Andy Warhol. We wouldn't know who this is and our lives would probably be a little less empty because of the art that that man was able to create. What was it? You know, it, and I grew up right outside New York City. I was fascinated by this place as a kid. Would walk down, would sneak into the city just to look at it because I knew the art, the things that came out of it. It was actually architected. If you read about this, it is not by chance that this place happened. It was designed and it was built around creating collisions of individuals. It was managed by what people thought was a crazy man that made sure that the people coming in were different. Diversity was the core. It was based upon a philosophy of a Fourier that was about if you could bring different people together, you could create utopia. That was the vision. They didn't know what would happen, but the basis was if we build this thing, maybe we can find utopia. And I'll argue they did in many ways because it was about collaboration, 
It was about unlocking ideals and unlocking potential. But okay, sounds great. And I always thought there is no way to bring these two worlds together, right? I'm an engineer. I need to be predictable. I need to do things orderly. This is free time, you know, going down to the city and listening to punk rock music. Nothing to do with science and engineering. But how can we architect? Could we? And I always thought, could we do this thing in a better way? Because I knew that innovation funnel, it didn't really work that well. But I didn't want to tell anyone because that was my job. So out of years of frustration and some things that were happening and really a tough, tough business downturn, it was desperate times. And it was one where I felt, what do I got to lose? So we took that innovation budget that we had and I said, let's just do something totally radical, totally different. Let's build the Chelsea Hotel. And let's build the Chelsea Hotel for makers, for these weird people that didn't really fit in our company. Let's see what happens. And maybe just like that hotel, something cool is going to come out of it. So we asked ourselves, what if we invite consumers to define our, to define our priorities? This is the most important thing I have up on this and the most important thing I'm going to talk about today. This is the heart of our transformation. This is what has changed our company. This silly little question. But it was, how do you do it? How? This put us into this journey of what we call zero distance. So if you look at our company, what the main thing we're on is we want to be zero distance from our customers because we want them, we want them to tell us what to do, not us to tell them what they should buy. We've got to flip this whole thing upside down. Then we asked, you know, how are we going to run this place? You know, I lived in two worlds. I'm a mechanical engineer, hardware, hardware, you use waterfall development. Software, you use Agile. And I saw how good Agile was. I saw the flow and that the products that came out were always better than what we thought going in. But I always said that will not work for hardware. It's impossible because I got to buy tools. I got to buy equipment. I'm, I'm spending large capital dollars. Software, yeah, I can change words. It's like writing. But in a mechanical world, how do you do it? So he says, you know what, what if we try to build this place and use Agile? Because I said, if I could do this, maybe I could get the value and the things that I see in the software world and the hardware world. And you know what, what do I got to lose anyways? So we started down that road. Taking a play from Chelsea Hotel, I said, we got to have diversity at the core. We have to have difference at the core because that's the only way we see these good ideas. So this is a wheel that comes out of MIT Media Labs. And this was what we used at the beginning to guide us on how do we manage our hotel. Now, as an engineer, I always deal with science, right? You need to know Newton, you need to know formulas, and design, because if you have engineers design things, they're ugly and they look like a box, okay? So that is the world I lived in. But art, that's what I did for enjoyment, not work. But what we did when we opened First Build is we crash those two together. And I'll tell you, the engineers didn't like it. Why are you wasting my time bringing these crazy people down here that are actually making junk when we got to make real things that people are going to use? But we did it, and we wanted to see what would happen. It was an experiment. And we built First Build, and this is what it looks like. And it is totally different than what you would think out of an innovation lab. Totally different space. Now, how are these two compared? You know, what are they? They have very, very many similarities. We say we want to innovate for people and communities. You know, that's what appliances are. Appliances are there to make your life better and make your life easier. We wanted to focus on the maker community. We thought that was maybe where we could get these kind of artists that knew how to build and do things. We found later that that was too restrictive, but that's a story for another day. One of the things that was so important to me was Daryl showed the best picture is what do corporations do when they get mature? They run operations, and when times get tough, you want to get rid of innovation, all right? You got to shrink that down to protect your core. So I said, we've got to make this self-funding. And why can't innovation be self-funding? If it truly creates value, why is it always a cost center at a company? Why can't it be a profit center? And that's what we said. First build to live, it's got to make its own money. It's guided by principle, not by rulers, and it's got to be passion-driven. Passion is the core of what drives that business, passion. And 
not you don't hear that many places. That is an organization built around seeking passion, is what we found out it is. You know, you look at the people that are down there. They're very much like Eric, Andy Warhol. You know, we've had engineers that just, you would say, they're poor performers, they're kind of odd. We found the artist in those people. They've created incredible things that I, I tell you they would have never created at our core company, managed at, by me as an engineering manager at the time. And, and we realized that there was so much human potential in corporations. That, and everyone's always saying, oh, we got to get new people. We need better people. You don't. You don't. You've got to do what Daryl talked about. You've got to get their brains right, and you've got to unlock the potential that's hidden inside them and that you maybe are actually suppressing. So if you look, moving on on this, it worked. It really worked, and it is still working today. We've created some great products out of it. Opal Nugget Ice, in Europe, maybe in Many don't know about it, but the U.S., this is a hot product. This was like one of the number one bestsellers, Amazon Prime Day. It is done fantastic. It's chewable ice. I never knew people like chewable ice. Nobody. But these passionate people about chewable ice created this product, and it's crazy. There is a lot of them out there. We're based in Louisville, Kentucky. What do people do in Louisville, Kentucky? They watch horses race, and they drink bourbon. And they didn't like the way the ice cubes work in bourbon. I'm, not a, I'm a beer drinker. I'm not a bourbon drinker. But this creates an incredible clear round sphere of ice that people seem to like in their bourbon. You know, things like the hearth oven. People, if there's people that are passionate about pizza, you want to cook a true Neapolitan pizza, it needs to be cooked in a minute, around 50 seconds. You can never do that in your home. You can now. Because those pizza makers got together and they created a product that is a little crazy. It gets around 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit inside your kitchen, which typically didn't happen before, but it can happen now because what these engineers and these artists did down there at first build. Then we've done things that it's led us places that we didn't even know existed. Mushroom growing. During the pandemic, a person down there got into growing mushrooms, not psychedelic ones, the ones that you eat, but got together, there's a big community of people that seem to love mushrooms. And what we did is, through that community, created, created this mushroom grower. And it is a community of different businesses, actually, that are involved. And some people are selling mushroom fruiting chambers, etc. And we made mushroom growing better. We made it easier for people. But it wasn't us as a company. We weren't, weren't the center of that project, but we are part of it. We also found the Jewish community very unsatisfied with how their products work. We didn't know that, but we worked with them. We worked with rabbis. We worked with people in the community. We work with different companies. We have solutions now that are changing the lives of many of the Jewish community. We work very closely in Brooklyn, New York, and others to change that experience. The only way we discovered that is through this openness, through this community. We also, people have heard of food deserts in poor communities. We didn't know there's also clothing deserts. So we were able to get together and work with those communities to give a real life solution of how do we bring clothes care to the communities that didn't have these opportunities. That's happening by opening up, opening up and working with others, but also this iteration, this agile development, because none of these would ever be in a corporate playbook plan. They would never be there because it's, it's very hard for finance people to understand what's the mushroom market out there for making a grower. So what did we do? You know, we said, hey, this is great for first build, but how do we scale it? How do we change our company? Because I had two worlds. I would go down there and feel cool. I sneak in there on the weekend. On Sunday, and HR doesn't like it, but a lot of people have found ways to actually break into first build and work. And then I knew we did something good. When people are actually fighting to get into work, something's different. Because where I work every day, we fight at 5 o'clock to get the hell home. Okay? So I had this dream, can we bring that kind of mentality back to a larger corporation? Can we transform? It gave us an idea. So what have we done? We've done a lot of things to try to, are we there yet? No. But I'll show you, we're getting a lot closer. And we are such a different company than we were just five years ago. Five years, we've made this transformation of how do we take that first build kind of crazy place and bring those lessons back to the core. We were able to break the company down to smaller, more nimble things. 
And really that's about break bureaucracy. You have to break down the bureaucracy of these systems. You can't be managed from the top. You know, we had to have the priorities defined by customers. Not this five-year plan that we all like to see so we know in three years I'm gonna be working on this. It's ridiculous, right? Like just what happened with this pandemic, it wasn't predicted, but we had to change, we had to adapt. And I'll argue that we were able to adapt quicker, learn faster than other organizations because of these lessons we had had before that. It made us much more robust to these tough times that happened. Customers are at the center of what we do every day. Our, our philosophy is we're a zero distance company. And projects are developed with ecosystems, right? We've learned that we have to stop thinking that we're at the center of the universe. We're the most important thing. We're not, we're not at all. You don't buy an appliance to have an appliance. You buy them to make your life better, to cook food, to do different things. So we have to work with that interaction. It got down to leadership, our leadership model. How are we as a company? It starts with me. You know, as the CEO of that company, I have to get rid of this top-down control. I have to redefine the role. Maybe it's a little easier for me. I'm really an engineer. <laughs> I don't consider myself a CEO. You know, I'm here to ensure that we've got freedom. There's freedom for ideas. There's freedom for people to come up with things and stop telling people what to do. What we call ME leaders, those are our business leaders, micro enterprise leaders. Their job is to unleash the potential of their, of their employees. And then as employees, we don't want robots. And I'll tell you, we were on a line of a lot of managers that I worked for wish I was a robot and many others were a robot. And that's not what we want. We, we have to look at each employee to see if they're not performing, is it our fault? Is it us, not the employee? And consumers, they have to be the center because they can tell us how to make our company better. They're the only ones that really know how we're going to be a better company, how we're going to grow, how we're going to thrive. So it does feel good. I'd like to say that, hey, we've transformed. But this is a constant fight to not go backwards. You know, you heard that at the very beginning. And I worry that a new person comes in or, or tough times. We're in very hard, you know, economic times right now. I have a lot of people, and even as of yesterday, on the phone of, we need to get rid of MEs, we need to go back. Because these traditions, you know, of a company, it's like, you know, what we're doing is weird. Maybe we should go back and do it the way we, we used to. Now what's helping us is we know what we did didn't work because we failed as a company. And we cannot go back. So we've got to keep reminding ourselves, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. Have humility. Leaders need humility to understand they don't have the answers. The answers are outside. So results, you know, what's happened to us? We've been the fastest growing appliance company in the US. We've had four years of double digit growth. Every micro enterprise that we have has gained share. We've transformed what this company was. We went from the fourth company, we had, and we were going down to be the fifth pretty soon, to go to be the number one company in the US. That happened quickly. That happened in literally in five years, we went from being fairly irrelevant to being on top of the heap. But we have to have humility because we realize that it is so easy to go from here to there. And the only way that we have to do is we have to keep iterating, we have to have an innovation model that listens to the consumers and that always keeps the humility within the company and make sure that every day we're trying to get closer and closer and achieve this zero distance. And with that, I know we're going to continue to have a bright future. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Is it on? It is. It is. I'll tell you what, it's been fantastic. We've only had two talks on already. So much insight and wealth of experience. Thank you so, so much. Um, what are people thinking so far? Excuse me, sir, Mr. Chet Hendrickson, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Did you enjoy the first two? I did enjoy them very much. I'm going to go get me a uh, soft ice machine as soon as I leave here. The little, the little balls? I like, I like the cheese too much. My wife likes ice in her bourbon, so it's a perfect solution. It's going to say, because you don't drink bourbon, so, you know. But... It's, it's worth it. So we've got some eyes. So hey, keep, keep the conversations going. We'll now invite the World Agility Fortnight to
team to the to the stage, I believe. You can wander up and then you'll have a variety of questions brought to you. Thank you very much. I'm basically, me and Maria, Maria are basically chief cat herders. And we're looking at timers thinking, come on. So some inspiring talks going on. Hopefully you've got your uh, microphones. I'll leave you for a debate. So um, if you think of an iconic brand, you know, GE is an iconic brand, right? Absolutely. Um, and that brand in the, you know, I'm aging myself now, but in the 80s, 90s and forward was run with the, the famous GE management system. And we all drank the Kool-Aid, right? I mean, that this was the way to do things. So I'm curious when confronted with people saying, but wait a minute, we, we know this playbook, we know this is how it works, we've done this for literally decades. We built this iconic brand. What, what is on your brain trying to change this? What's interesting is I was part of that system. No, I'm good. I'm mic'd up. So I was part of that system, and I made a career out of it. And there was a point when we got, because we, we were sold. We were sold around six years ago. That It's a lot of soul searching. And, but before that, in 2008, they tried to sell us. So being sold is bad, but not being able to be sold is really <laughs> bad. Because it means you're so bad, nobody even wants you. So in 2008 was that crisis that created First Bill for me because I had to really look at, and I never wanted to do it. I looked at what finance is good at doing of that innovation funnel and found out that the payback was terrible. It was really the smart thing to do was to shut it down because we were plowing money into ideas that, as Daryl showed you, that when they got out of it, nobody bought. And that was hard to do. Um, but I was at a point with, what do I have to lose? And it was liberating, but at the same time scary, because I think a lot of it is just what we're used to. Um, but what I hate is crisis usually drives change. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we could just be smarter and learn from others, but I don't, it doesn't seem like human nature. <laughs> How come GE? I mean, they had the world's smartest people, best engineers, best financial people. How come they didn't see this and, and it just kept grinding on on this factory? I think the problem too is it's, it, it's controlled. Yeah, they're, they're the smartest people, but are they the smartest at understanding what consumers want, right? Or are they smarter at just or running an operation? And I think, and that's why I think that beginning, we need innovation is so key. So they lost their way. Thomas Edison was probably the greatest innovator in the world. What happened to Thomas Edison? JP Morgan forced him out of the company because he was too crazy. So if it used to be called the General, the General Electric, Edison General Electric Company. When Morgan got in and made the big investment, they wanted his name even out of the company. So when you're taking out innovation away from the company, it's probably, a, it took a long time to come to roost, but eventually it does when you don't innovate. So, but Jack Welsh was known to having said, uh, when you have staff focused on their boss, they, are, they have their backside to the customer. We don't want that in our company. Yet, that's what the company did. How, how did that happen? Yeah, and it's funny. A lot of what we're doing now is actually lessons I learned working under Jack Welch. So he had a lot of good lessons, workout, empowerment. Mm -hmm. So if you look at when I joined the company, that was really at the height of Jack Welch. Those were a lot of good lessons that in tough times, I think we forgot. You know, you didn't hear empowerment too much in the company. You didn't hear workout. Workout was really a form of a, a we got together and let's iterate ideas. Mm -hmm. So Welch had a lot of these, but I don't think we institutionalized those into our system. Um, I think I'm mic'd up. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. One of the questions I have is when I'm working with organizations most of the people in the organization would love to be working in more agile ways. In fact, it's not unusual once we get a couple of teams going for people to say, I'll never go back to the old way of working. Their frustration is often with senior management who doesn't understand agile, is not, it's, it feels a little frou-frou. It feels like it's 
almost abdication of responsibility, dereliction of duty to turn that kind of control over to the organization. If you think about yourself and the changes that you've made, number one, just how did it feel as a leader? And number two, if you're, if you're somebody in the middle of the organization who would love to try to get the senior leadership to understand this and pay more attention to it, how would you do that? I think the hard thing is one is, you know, what were senior leaders, why, why are they there? Well, what, what were they trying to achieve? Are they trying to achieve power and control? Which I think a lot of them are, it's hard. Because they're saying, I finally got to the top and you want me to be humble and listen to others and not order them what to do? So that I think is, is part of the dilemma is we have to rethink, you know, why are we here? Are we here to serve or are we here to order? And I hate to say it, I'm a little pessimistic at times because we need to reframe that. And I think the best way is to have companies be more successful, running in an agile way, and let companies like ourselves, seeing that the way you're running is not successful, and either you're gonna die or you're gonna change. And it's a tough lesson, but I think it's one a lot of companies are gonna learn whether they like it or not. So two of the biggest barriers I've observed when companies try to become more innovative, right? And, and I hear all the time, oh, our, our budget doesn't permit that. So I'd love to know how you figure out budgets. And then the second thing is incentives. You know, as, as hierarchies get flatter and you're sort of paid for your skills and more and more of us have jobs that look like making a movie, where you know, your, your measure of progress is not moving up a hierarchy, it's doing something different. How do you, I mean, how do, you do that at scale? I, I think that would be a really core question. Yeah. So Daryl said it before, you need two worlds. And I think that's what's hard too, is you still need to have this predictive world. When we're building a new manufacturing plant, it's kind of like launching that airplane. You're investing, you know, it could be $100 million of capital. You don't want to be having some kind of crazy thing. So you have that world you need. But the innovation side needs to be this unpredictable thing you don't know. So I think the problem you see is every company looks at what's your percent of you know, revenue to, for R&D. And a good company, they'll say, is 3%, 4%. A lot of investors will look at that metric. That metric, to me, is the problem that we all are facing right now. Because in tough times, the easiest thing to cut is the future, because you've got to live for today. So the, the, the crazy idea we had with First Build, of what if we can take that equation and do a divide by zero? So if your innovation actually at least even break even, so first build's kind of cheating because I don't need to be that profitable. If I just break even and I'm spawning off innovation for the parent, who would kill it? You know, and as an engineer, the finance guys are the people you get really scared of when they walk in because they are like the grim reaper coming <laughs> when your project's not going well. And so the whole thing, my dream was, can I please let it so I don't have to worry about these finance guys during budget season? <laughs> And you can do that if your innovation adds value and creates revenue. So First Build does that. It's been very, very successful. And that is what's going to make it live. When I leave, why would you kill it if it has revenue, has money coming in, and it's giving you innovation? So I think this whole notion that revenue has to, excuse me, innovation has to be a cost center, that's what we got to break. That's what we got to change. And then it'll be a much better world to work in. I'm curious as a leader, how you were introduced to the tools that brought you to the development of 1B. Like 1B was the end result that then became your innovation engine. And it's fascinating to look at. But when I look at, I have more experience with smaller companies and it's usually a transformation comes in one of two ways. An engineer comes in that it was exposed to all the agile software methodologies and has a large voice and brings that to the organization. Or in my world, I'm a venture capitalist. We fund companies. According to Daryl, 67% of them pivot. It's <laughs> more like better, 97. Right? <laughs> no, it's more like 97% of them pivot. Um, we were talking about this at dinner last night. Then we, as the investors and board members, usually introduce them to tools and processes or people that can help them. Um, I'm assuming you had access to that, but I'm curious as a leader, like how you were exposed to those tools and then how you were able to apply them. Yeah, so that, that time when I said it was tough, when we couldn't get sold, I actually took a couple of weeks, me and another colleague, and we just said, we're gonna go out and explore. And we went and met a bunch of crazy startups and saw how, and then there was one startup that GE at the time was investing in called Quirky. Now it failed, 
but and there's a long story behind it but they kind of insulted us that oh you're slow moving you stupid corporate people and they assaulted me and they didn't realize it as and i remember jeff emmelt saying i told you you were slow and stupid <laughs> and so i said well i'm going to go see what this kid's all about and what he's thinking and we actually worked together and i said i can teach you something but what happened is he taught me more than i taught him by far and I really started to learn, you know, there could be a different way. So that kind of external view made me rethink a lot and I think learn a lot of lessons. I knew Agile, I knew all these things, but I never saw it being applied in that manner. And then what is a, what's in the mind of a startup? And that was very foreign growing up in a major corporation. And I think that was liberating to kind of see those lessons and learn those things. Because a lot of us, you're in a big company and people were making fun of quirky has there is so many lessons that we can learn from what they had. And I think that's you know, the arrogance that comes into big companies stops you from learning. And we've got to drop that arrogance. And you went out to talk to those startups. Was that like random? You just bumped into Quirky? Or was it deliberate that you said, I'm going to go engage with smaller organizations? It was, to it learn? was deliberate. And then the whole maker thing, you know, I've always been a, you know, I've always made things. I didn't consider myself a maker. We went to a bunch of maker space. The thing that was really, I think, the thing that said, I've got to do this, is one night, me and my colleague, maybe we had a too, many drink, too many drinks, and we said, you know what, let's just stop talking and let's go see. And we went to our local makerspace in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and I walked in there, it was 10.30 at night on a Wednesday, and I walk in and this guy goes, what are you doing here? Like almost scared that saw me. It was an engineer that worked for us. And there were three of them in there, and I'm like, what are you doing there? And it was like this clash of cultures. And I felt terrible. I'm like, this person, which I didn't think was a very good engineer, is escaping from us, but he's still working at 10.30 at night on a Wednesday. Why can't he have that much fun at work? That gave me the thing that I said, I'm changing. That I have to change. You didn't say much about your new owner, Hayer. <laughs> You did mention zero distance, which of course comes from there, but could you say a little more about the experience of having a new owner and how that uh, impacted what you were, your journey? Yeah, so that, that was an interesting one. So at GE, um, when they saw First Build, everyone thought it was just some crazy thing Kevin's up to. And then when we were for, for sale, of course, people walk through and see the different things and I'm pitching, you know, this, and I was really pitching hard on First Build because I didn't want this new owner to come kill it, because it was fun. And every CEO, oh, what about your IP? What about this? Every buyer was coming in with these standard questions that I would go through. When the chairman of High Air came in, he got it like that. I didn't even have to tell him what was going on. And I said, whoa, this is interesting. I didn't know much about High Air. And then the word zero distance, that actually came from High Air. You know, that's what they're on. They were on to this same journey. I don't think they understood how to do a first build, but it, it's the most consumer-centric organization I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, we think, oh, it's a Chinese company. It's going to be top-down. Not at all. Not at all. So it's very unexpected. And so this owner, I think, has allowed, number one, me to be CEO. I think as GE, they would never put someone like me as, uh, as CEO of the appliance business. It's a little bit too crazy. Um, but they placed the bet. And I want to always thank them for doing that. It, as good as agile ways of working are, they're not perfect. You're not going to have 100% success rate. How do you evaluate and how do you reward people that work on something that seemed worth trying, but it, it failed, it, it didn't work? How do you do that? Yeah, so if you look at first build, we've had many more failures than success, many, many more. And they've learned, and there's a process there, so it's not chaos. And I think they've gotten to something now where they have, every Wednesday they have passion, a passion drive. So we come in, and that day everyone just looks at, find a passionate area. Something people are passionate about, it could be anything. Right now they're into bass fishing, like I don't, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> but they've tried to go through that if there's not a passionate community, then you can't work on it. And then they say, once I do find a passion, is there any unmet need? So th we, we've tried to put failure so far up in, the, up in the process, but it happens time and time again where, and the way we work is we don't know what we're gonna work on there, but we very public, you can go on firstbuild.com, anyone can see what's happening there. And that's how we know what to work on. Because if we 
put a YouTube out there, and we use YouTube ex extensively. You put a video out there and no one's interested in it, boom, program's dead. It just, it just kills. And so there's no management, really. The management is by, by people that are passionate about what we're doing. We had one that was an indoor smoker that's getting launched now. I tried to kill it because I don't like smoke, and I thought, Smoking meat inside your house is kind of a dumb idea. <laughs> and they, but this community just kept working and working and working, and they figured out how to do it, and it's going to come out. And that really made me feel good because, boy, I would have killed that a long time ago, but I couldn't. <laughs> I didn't have the right. So can someone get a good performance evaluation and compensation bonus if they've worked on three failures in a year? At first build, definitely. I mean, that doesn't affect it at all because it's kind of as an entity, what do we do? And now when you get into the core business, then we got to perform. And that's where these two worlds have to work together. But I think what people have learned, maybe through our experience, is you better have good innovative products coming out or it's a race to the bottom. Maybe we hear from the audience questions uh, you've heard a lot already. Um, would you like to ask a question? So we're thinking about that as well. So yeah, agile alone is not enough. Resilience is key. How innovative are you all feeling? <clears throat> are there any questions? Are there any questions at all? Just be careful because these people here may ask you a question. <laughs> a question. We've got one over here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sergio. I'm a Scrum Master. Currently on a mobile gaming development company. And one of the things that I see is how do you balance that two worlds that you're seeing about when you talk about financial part and you have that strict hierarchy and the innovation part? Because, well, gaming development companies, people think that are only one part of the reality, but all companies have both. And I want to understand how you balance those. Because it's hard to provide people with a safe environment for them to be innovative, but also to continue merging forward with the compensations, with the evolution on the career. So I would like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I'd say, you know, just thinking, I'd say the market is what's going to balance you, all right? You have to perform in the market. So if you look at us, we're an appliance company. Now we're transforming. We're getting into areas, and it's leading us into different places now. But in that area is you have to perform. You have competition, and you have financial results you have to deliver, right? We're, companies are made there. We're made to make money to make a profit. And that's going to that's gonna direct you to run a good company, to be efficient. You know, I'm a big student of lean, and you, know, you, have to, you have to keep optimizing, you have to keep improving your company, and you have to keep posting up those financial results. So your two worlds are gonna be there. I think what happens is, is that innovation world is harder to measure. So that other world's so easy to measure, we tend to work on it more, and we tend to focus in on it more. So I think as leaders, we've gotta have ways to balance our time, and I think What's liberated me is trying not to be this top down. There's more time. There's more time to help and coach. So I think if we can, as a leader, kind of give up this thing, you don't need to control everything and get the confidence that your people, they can run these businesses. If you look at our microenterprises, we started with four, we now have about 15. I spend very little time with the big microenterprises. Those leaders know how to run those businesses, quite frankly, much better than I do. What I spend my time is on coaching the small ones, you know, where we're still at this very vulnerable stage. It's just a parent. Who are you going to spend time with, your, your youngest or the person who's already working and is established? And I think as companies, we've got to keep remembering that. It's not a waste of time for the CEO to go down to first build and hang out with a bunch of kids that are working on a mushroom grower, right? It, it does have some value. You know, just to build on that a little bit, I, it seems to me like the way of working has to be suitable to the task, to the job that you're trying to get done. And we talk a lot about how bad waterfall is, but the truth of the matter is, if what you're trying to build is, is vague and unpredictable, agile ways of working are fabulous. If it actually is stable, and quite predictable, waterfall works. It can be very efficient. And if you need to develop something inside a single silo, waterfall works great. If you're gonna need cross-functional innovation, you, that is, I need somebody from marketing, I need somebody from supply chain, I need some, if it's cross-functional, 
and what you're trying to develop is unknowable, unpredictable. That's where Agile works. So I think it's a mistake, actually. I think it's a waste of resources to try to apply Agile ways of working to simple tasks. Uh, yes, occasionally you're going to collect ideas and you are going to go through innovation that will then become standard operating procedures. But it's not always the most efficient way to work in big cross-functional teams. You know, to build on that, Daryl, is we're, we're right now taking that first build model. We're creating what, what a business called Co-Create. It's in Stanford, Connecticut. And we were just there literally before flying over here yesterday and sitting down. And it's still an empty building where we're adding equipment. On the wall, you're going to see a waterfall. Because, you know what, we need electrical. We need lighting, right? We need the dock door that's going to fit the right kind of truck that's coming in. So it's a funny thing for me as I'm sitting there coaching the, that team on how to do waterfall because they're more used to doing agile. I'm like, no, we got to get this done on a certain <laughs> date because we're trying to have an event there in December. Right? And I need December 8th to have this thing finished. So it's funny. I'm actually going backwards and teaching them that, no, that's, don't use this agile right now. Please use waterfall because I want it done. That's, it's fascinating hearing you. And there's the buzzwords, right? We're here talking about agile. But innovation is, is the, the key thing we've been talking about this morning. But is there a danger, do any of you find, that you're not being able to speak to the right people? Some people associate Agile with software development. And you go in and you speak to them and you say, what about innovation? And they're like, well, that, that, that happens over there. Is there a, how can you break down the doors and make sure you do get that cross-functional approach and people don't just assume Agile means building software, but we have a, um, the right people innovating? Yeah, I think that's the problem, because look at myself. I'm a mechanical engineer, so I've been trained on basically waterfall, because that's typically where mechanical engineers, that's the world we work in. And so the, the, the software engineers are trained. The, and this came out of engineering for doing tasks. It, it wasn't developed as a way to manage or to do different things. So a lot of it is, I think, people that are running companies, can you take some of these people that have lived in an agile world and mix them in. So if you look at first bill, what we did is the engineering leader there was really better at agile than waterfall. So we took a software engineer to go run a hardware enterprise. That seems crazy, but that kind of broke the mentality because I didn't know how to apply it because I knew how to apply it to software and not hardware. Uh, the software folks know how to apply it in their world. They don't know hardware at all. So I think that's the evolution we've all got to do that's still going on right now is companies slowly figuring out that this can be used outside of just this software world because the fundamentals of it are, are amazing. That's a really fascinating point you made and you talked about the difficulties of hardware. What's interesting is that um, listening to someone recently who's working on MRI scanners for I'm cancer sure treatment is that hardware provides you with truly customer-centric feedback of the experience that you can't get from software. So there's something to be said for the compassion you get from the experience you get from hardware. Is there anyone else here? Any other questions? Wow. Wow. The lady in the middle, would you be so kind as to pass? Hi. Uh, so first, congratulations on the presentation and on your path. Um, I have a slightly different question, uh, and it's about you. Uh, and about, uh -oh. you make it sound so, <laughs> it's about you. You may say you don't want to answer it. Um, so you make it sound so easy to, as a leader, to admit that you're not running uh, the company as it should, that uh, you're having difficult to, um, to, to get the goals that you, you were set up to, um, what did you do as a leader to make yourself vulnerable and to accept that you need to pursue uh, different ways of working? Because you make it sound easy, but it's not. And we're talking about companies um, that um, have this arrogance that we know how to do it, we'll keep uh, doing that. And I think that uh, eventually we will repeat the cycle because nowadays we see um, a bunch of people going agile and um, as you were talking about waterfall is still needed and useful in, in some ways. Uh, 
uh, and we may uh, repeat this, the, the cycle and we may have leaders that will go uh, all the way around and no, we need only mm -hmm. to do this uh, in a agile way. So the question is, uh, what did you learn um, personally on your development as a leader that you can share to all of us and the next generation of leaders? Yeah, Thank so you. I'd say an advantage I think I've had, because I've thought about that, that a lot, is as an engineer, the people that you know say I'm doing a good job or a bad job is physics, right? So I've many times you make something and it doesn't work. And someone could say, oh, it's like your parents, you know, that picture is actually nice. No, it's not. <laughs> it's actually ugly because it doesn't physically work. So if you're an engineer and you're actually practicing, you have humility, whether you want to admit it or not. And I think that's a lot of us, you know, what's your real measure? Because these leaders, if they're in a company that's not thriving, there's something going on there. And so to me, measurement is at the base of everything. And I think the more you're, you're in touch with your measurement, you'll get humility if you're honest with yourself. You know, and that's another thing. Stop hanging around with people in the company to ask how you're doing and get outside. I get letters every day from consumers. They keep me humble because we're not where we need to be, right? We have to get better. So I'd say that there's more chance of just me just being too humble <laughs> than, you know, having arrogance. Um, but I think leaders, if they really, most leaders act arrogant, but they know they've got problems, right? But it's having, like when I go down to first build, I'm not that good an engineer. And I've learned so much from it because to go down there and perform on stage when you're designing, it's, it's humbling to see this kid that's in high school telling me what to do and telling me it doesn't work. So. I think making sure you still get out on the stage and perform will keep your keep your humility. So um, who handles the transformation from an innovative product to a producible product, i.e. at something that goes into the operation so it's repeatable and producible? Yeah, so that's something I think, that's why that old innovation product didn't work, because we would do something that, we've had some incredible innovation but then it wasn't accepted by the folks you wanted to pass it off to. So that's why first bill was about design, build, and sell. Because the other thing I've seen, I've had lots of, lots of ideas, and I always like those stupid marketing people didn't know what to do with it. Well, that probably wasn't true. It probably was a bad idea. <laughs> and so at first build, they have to bring it to market. Like if you look at that Opal, that's sold out of it. it. So they sell the products. So what we try to do is how do we outsell first build? So that product got too big for first build and had to graduate. But th they have to prove the customer acceptance, that whole stage. If you pass it off before then, it, it, you might actually kill an idea that was really good, but never actually got out to the customer. I think there's one more question I want to squeeze in over here. You, you've spoken about making the way of working fit the situation that you're in, right? Sometimes it's innovative, sometimes it's production, and so on. Um, and I suppose that people might be interested in doing um, a bunch of both, right? So they're not always doing the exact same thing and following the same um, patterns. But I'm wondering, in your experience, how open and flexible-minded people actually were in terms of, oh, now this is waterfall. Maybe I don't love it, but that's what the situation calls for. Yeah, it's a, I, I've seen that there, there are different kind of people, which is fine. I think we need them. And that's what we, we've, we've come up with the analogy of problem lovers and problem solvers. So problem solvers, they like to like that challenge of, can I open by December 8th? It's fun. I actually like doing that, too, of you got to organize and, you know, operate this thing. Now, a problem lover, they, what they do is they just love iterating, right? They, they just keep going and going and going, and they will drive you nuts if you, you actually want to get something done on a certain date. And there's nothing wrong. We need these people. And I think that's what the Chelsea Hotel told. They need to keep the doors open, right? You need to run that. And we're different. There's different people. So how can you have an organization where where it's fine, you know, because you do need both. And I think that's what I worry, that people say that, hey, you're, you love First Bill. You love... No, we have to value all these people. And that gets to this diversity, this inclusion that we need to, we need to focus on. Thank you so, so much. A massive, massive round of applause to our World Agility Forum.